Are you there? Are you? Yes, we're just going to wait uh, one more minute and then we'll get started with the webinar. Alrighty. Hi, I hope everyone is doing well this morning. Um, hello and welcome to the Embedded Security for Avionics webinar presented by our very own engineer, Tessa Mile at Wolf SSL. My name is Kajal and I will be moderating this webinar. All attendees will be in listen only mode. There will, however, be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to enter any questions in the Q&A box to be addressed during the Q&A time. Uh, this webinar will also be recorded and made available via a link following the presentation. And now, without further ado, I present Tesfa. Hi, thank you, Kajal. Uh, hi, welcome. Thanks for joining the uh, Embedded Security for Avionics webinar. Um, so in this webinar, we will, will cover secure boot, secure update, and secure transport. And we'll cover why it matters, why you need to secure uh, your bootloader, you need to use a secure bootloader for firmware update, and how to secure transferring um, your firmware image from your server into the target. Uh, I'll also walk you through some demo um, example products. Okay. So I would like to spend about a minute to go over the products at Wolf SSL. So today we're going to cover um, Wolf Boot which provides the secure boot and secure update functionality. Uh, we also talk about Wolf SSL. This one is for the secure transport. And uh, both Wolf SSL and Wolf Boot uses WolfCrypt, which is the fun foundation cryptography that is actually used by all our products. And in addition to those product, products, we've got wrappers for uh, the Wolf SSL. In fact, instead of going through this PowerPoint slide, I should probably um, show you where you can download, evaluate, and test uh, any of this source code. So if you go to our website, Wait. Okay. If you go to wolfssl.com download, um, you see um, all the products that are available under GPO v2. Um, so the first one here is Wolf SSL. Wolf SSL had a new release um, last week. Uh, so it's uh, actually this week, version 4.4.0. And, um, you know, you can download other source codes as well. The previous version, if you need FIP solution, um, we support Wolf TPM and we're gonna cover that the secure boot um, can plug or use Wolf TPM uh, to, um, and you can use Wolf MQTT to communicate, securely communicate um, between two um, endpoints uh, we also have Wolf SSH, uh, 
as well as you know the wolf boot that we're going to cover here again you can download evaluate and test in addition we've got the curl uh, which is missing from the slide but we've got tiny curl which is really small for embedded environment or typically for aerospace um, avionics you uh, probably are using curl it's widely used product and we have additional um, script wrappers uh, for Wolf SSL. Now, let me go back to the slide. So currently we are securing over 2 billion connections um, and we work with over a thousand OEM customers. And uh, we're really excited uh, to uh, lead in terms of bringing uh, privacy and security, and now recently safety um, to uh, the industry. So we're known for Wolf SSL, which is SSL TLS um, product. And that's you know, supported by major Linux distributions, um, including Open WRT, Open Embedded Yacto, um, from about a year ago, we started adding the safety component so that avionics um, can utilize uh, DO-178C uh, uh, certifiable evidence uh, cryptography. Um, so for that effort, we actually um, have examples of the client and server example using the DDCI DOS. Uh, RTOS, uh, as well as benchmark for WolfCrypt. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned previously, WolfCrypt is the foundation for all our product because you need encryption, you need to do encryption and authentication. Um, so for that, we've got three different products. We've got the FIPS ready um, that you saw on the download page. You can actually download the FIPS uh, 140-2 uh, ready code and test it, evaluate it. It doesn't come with a certificate, but it comes with all the source code uh, so that you can integrate it with your system and test it out. Uh, so when you need a certificate, you come to us, you come to us. Um, in addition, we offer professional services for optimization and integration. So for example, uh, for Wolfboot, uh, we've done um, a recent job for a big company uh, to replace U-Boot with Wolfboot. Uh, we'll go into the details of how you do a secure boot and secure update using uh, our solution, which is a secure boot loader. I guess for avionics, DO-178C is relevant. I mean, the DO-178C is a software consideration in airborne systems and equipment certification. It's basically a document published by uh, RTCA and uh, a lot of operating systems uh, as, well, as well as hardware uh, need to be certified to DO-178C uh, to be able to fly uh, or in a commercial space. So. Uh, our first product, the DO-178C-A WolfCrypt solution, um, is, a, is a building block for secure boot, secure update, and secure transport. And we support, um, and we're doing this incrementally. But the first one for message digest, we support SHA-256 um, for public cryptography. We support RSA sign and verify using SHA-2. To 56 algorithm uh, for encryption and decrypting data. Uh, we support AES in two different modes. Um, in addition for AEAD, which is authenticated encryption with associated data, similar to the functionality AES GCM gives you, we've got ChaCha20, Poly1305. And when you combine, um, this one is for encryption Poly is for authentication. When you combine the two, you get authenticated encryption with associated data. In fact, 
uh, I will do a quick walkthrough of the certification data package for this product, um, for this uh, AAD product. And uh, you know, uh, so let me quickly go over the roadmap. Um, people talk about, when we talk about DL170 AC, uh, the most common question that we get is, uh, hey, when do you support TLS 1.3? Uh, and uh, it's just coming. Um, initially for Q1, we've got the um, foundation that is needed for secure boot uh, and update and transport. And for Q2, we will have a certification package for Wolf Boot Secure Boot and uh, DTLS followed by in 2021, we're aiming to get uh, DO 170 AC certification evidence for TLS 1.3 code base. Um, Wolf SSL was the first commercial company that implemented TLS 1.3 and we thrive to be the first one to get DO 170 AC certification for uh, communication using the TLS uh, 1.3 product. Okay, now going back to um, secure and remote update, right? Uh, when you talk about updating firmware, why do you need to update? You know, often there could be fixes that you want to push. There may be vulnerability that have been discovered and you've got a target that is out deployed on the field and um, you want to protect it. So somehow you need to update uh, your image that is out and about. Um, and you know, updates are really easy in most OSs, right? So you could use a typical package manager for security updates. Um, you know, even advanced bootloaders nowadays say, uh, can manage the full partition of your drive and they could do a kernel update. So you even have a TCP IP uh, uh, fully uh, loaded. Um, and, uh, uh, but for microcontrollers or for proprietary systems in aerospace, um, it's not easy to uh, do a remote update. You know, for example, if you've got a if you've got a, a plane uh, parked somewhere and you want to update um, your firmware, you know, how do you do it safely? Uh, um, so for example, you do not want the person who's uh, updating your firmware to load in a different image, right? Um, so there isn't really a standard on remote updates Usually IoT vendors are reinventing the wheel for firmware updates. Most bare metal and our cost solutions use a flat memory um, and uh, they're easily to exploit unless uh, you add safety and security constraint on it, right? And also um, it's really hard to come up with a standard um, remote update mechanisms because often the connectivity technology is, is widespread. You, know, you can have ethernet, Wi-Fi, uh, BLE, you know, and the systems you may have, you know, SpaceWire 1553 and other proprietary uh, connectivity technology. So it makes it really difficult um, uh, to do a, a remote update. So not only is it difficult to do a remote update, there isn't really a requirement up until recently where uh, luckily the IETF group are working on an internal draft. So if you look up for the draft IETF architecture 05 on the web, um, you will find three requirements. So basically, the bootloader must be minimal, um, containing only flash support, cryptography primitive, and optionally a recovery mechanism. And the second one is 
remote firmware transfer is implemented in the application. Uh, so it, it does not really depend on the connectivity technology. So they want to decouple that. And the bootloader must provide secure mechanism based on asymmetric cryptography for authenticity and integrity of the firmware. Not only do you want to know um, you are using the right image that has not been modified, but you also want to uh, do a authentication verification. So um, this document is the basis for requirement for implementing Wolf Boot um, at Wolf SSL. So the Wolf Boot Secure Boot initially was supported for 32-bit microcontroller. So it's really OS agnostic. It runs on 32-bit microcontroller ARM, RISC, MEV3, uh, MEV32. Um, and uh, the firmware is verified at boot time. So there isn't any additional hardware required. Um, and it can support platform specific trusted element or hardware encryption. Um, and in most cases, you can chain it as a second boot stage, uh, you know, to integrate it and to bring in that capability to authenticate an image if you already have a first stage bootloader. It supports multi-slot partitioning or programming flash. Um, support for update from external SPI flash. I mean, this is really relevant for microcontrollers where the flash is limited and you can um, utilize external SPI flash. You know, for that, you need a small code to access the SPI flash device driver code. Uh, other than that, um, this is really OS agnostic. So uh, the diagram here talks about, shows the interface between um, the application or your RTOS and Wolfboot. So basically there are two functions. Um, remember Wolfboot doesn't have connectivity to the outside world, um, but the application does, and this is done intentionally. You do not, because you want to minimize the surface attack. Um, and this complies with the uh, draft requirement. And the application can make an update or confirm uh, API call to live uh, to Wolfboot. And Wolfboot has the vendor public key. And it, using the vendor public key, it can validate and verify and authenticate the firmware. And if you're using for the um, flash, there is a small code and usually you want to be able to initialize and you wanna unlock the flash, you wanna write to the flash, you wanna erase and uh, uh, you wanna lock the flash. You know, we've got a number of examples for different architectures. Um, so this one is uh, target specific, but everything else is not. And for WolfGrip, you've got a couple options, um, the DL170AC or FIPS 140-2. Um, and if you're using the DL170AC, uh, you get a lot of documentation. Um, you generated a traceable art artifacts, tracing you know, requirement all the way to test result. And uh, I'll, I'll I'll walk you through an example of what a certification data package looks like. Um, right next. So when you do a Wolf Boot Secure update, update it uses multi-slot partitioning. So you basically have um, the beginning of the flash uh, has a bootloader and then you the boot partition contains the current firmware okay. and the update partition will contain the update received by the application and uh, 
the bootloader will validate using the key in the and if that succeeds then you do a swap and there's a small space for swap partition um, so this one is to keep track of the state in terms in, in case something goes wrong during the update you can re roll back or revert back and quite recently we've added another mechanism which isn't covered here there's an AB approach for uh, position independent firmware image. And it's, it's not really recommended for microcontrollers because of physical memory mapping constraint. But usually um, with the AB approach, you would have two partitions only uh, in non-volatile memory. Uh, and they share the same hierarchy level update is installed in the partition currently not in use. And then the old firm is kept in place to allow fallback. Uh, so that is a feature that has been added recently, but it's not in the slide yet. Okay, well, how do you put all this together? You know, how do you do a secure update? So, um, so I, the first step, is to use a tool that comes with Wolfboot to generate the public key and the private key, okay? So on the server, you've got the private key, you've got your firmware image, and you've got the version number. And the version number is important and it's incremented up. Uh, we want to avoid a roll back attack. So uh, you, take, you, you take all this tool and you sign the firmware on the server. And once you generate the private and public key, the private key stays on the server. It never leaves the server, right? So you've got a signed firmware here. And uh, the public key is part of the wolf group, uh, which is burned on your target, on your flash. Uh, now, somehow you need to send the firmware from your server to the target, which has your wolf boat. And uh, you do not want anyone intercepting the image and changing it or anything like that. So this is where TLS comes in. TLS is pretty handy in terms of securing uh, the communication between two endpoints. And if you use wolf TLS, uh, I mean, uh, wolf SSL solution uh, with TLS 1.3, to securely send, do secure uh, transport. Right? So once we get to the target, uh, we'll, I'll walk you through a, a real life use example. So basically, if you look at the uh, application entry point, uh, the application entry point will be the boot partition. So this one is burned using a JTAG or other mechanisms on your target. Um, it's followed by the header file and the firmware. Uh, and if you look at the header file, it contains a number of fields. It contains the signature, it's the important one, and the SHA-256 digest or integrity check and the timestamp um, a magic number, among other things. Um, and usually, you only need to change the starting point of the flash section on the linker script. You know, once you do that, you're good to go. Um, and it's important that you set it, you set the linker at 256 byte after the beginning of the partition. So let me walk you through a, a real life use case. And uh, so you're, you've got your target, you've got your server, and um, you know you create a partition, you've got the boot loader space, the first one, the boot partition, the update partition in the swap space. Uh, so you use a JTAG right, to uh, load your wolf boot 
with the first partition. Um, and then you take firmware, the version number, and you sign it using your private key. And again, you use a JTAG and you burn the image on the second partition. So this is a factory firmware here in the update partition is untouched and you've got the swap partition. So at this point, you can remove JTAG, right? And your target is happy running somewhere far. Um, so if you want to do an update, so what, what you do is, you, again, you take the firmware, you up the version number, and you use your private key that never left your server, um, and uh, you sign your image, and you send it um, securely using Wolf uh, SSL TLS 1.3. And uh, your application that's running on the target, which has connectivity to the outside world, would receive the firmware image and it would call Wolf Boot to do an update. So Wolf Boot is notified about the update and does the following, right? So first, I mean, the Wolf Boot has a public key. Um, so it checks a new image is newer than the existing one. Uh, that's a, the version number because you want to prevent rollback attacks. And then it verifies the integrity of the firmware image using SHA-256. So it computes the SHA-256 and you would port it to payload as well and it verify it. And if the verifies the authentication via digital signature of the firmware dig digest, uh, and you've got a number of options for those. You have to make a trade-off between space and performance. Um, um, you know, you can use RSA, ECC. Um, we actually have a pretty good uh, writing on the performance and the space trade-off on the web. I, I, can, I can show you a link. So if the update verification is successful, uh, you just do a swap. Now, this one is the updated image here on the second partition. And the previous firmware is on the third partition. So when you boot your target again, so uh, and the next put up, if the update is confirmed by setting a flag on the flash, the all firmware is erased and the system can boot normally. Right. Uh, from this point on, the system is ready to receive the next update. Right. This one is gone. And if the update fails, you know, this one fails, then the restoring process will get triggered and on the next boot up, the system will restore, I mean, swap the previous firmware in place on the second partition and you're back to using the old image that has been working well. So this one is relevant for microcontrollers. Um, I mean, when the programming flash is too small to contain to partition, an external ESPI can be used um, to store the firmware update. And uh, there's only uh, three additional functions that need to be added to be able to uh, access the data on the ESPI flash. And again, there are a number of examples in the code So for digital signature algorithms, um, there are three mechanisms are supported. The ADD 25519, the ECC with the uh, 256R1 curve, RSA 248, um, 
and some assembly optimization. When you start doing assembly optimization and adding the single precision, it bloats the code. So uh, that's when you need to make a trade-off between your performance and your footprint. Um, and then you, know, you can use, if you've got a TPM, um, you can you can use that to speed things up and to uh, reduce the bootloader size, right? Because the TPM will do the verification um, for you, uh, runs the algorithm a lot faster. Okay, uh, before I go here, let me, uh, let me point you to the uh, the performance for Wolf Boot. Um, I think at this point we cover Secure Boot, Secure Update, Secure Transport. So I like to uh, point you to the uh, performance um, page. I also would like to walk you through the uh, DO178C Wolf Group uh, certification data package. Um, and then I'll summarize and I'll open up for question. Okay, um, let's see. Yeah, if you go to our website and if you go to a remote firmware update for embedded systems, um, you know, you would see some benchmark uh, performance numbers comparing the different public algorithms, uh, uh, symmetric public key algorithms, the ADD, the ECC 256, uh, the RSA 2048, um, you know, in terms of, you know, this y-axis is a byte, the footprint size and the performance is uh, right here. So uh, this should give you a good idea of how to select which combination uh, when you build your wolf boot. Um, and also, I mean, you know, it's got some more information, the same information that we went over, uh, if you want to review in detail. Uh, what else? Um, let me go back to, let me see, do I have it? Okay. So usually um, for the certification data package, I mean, for AEAD as an example, uh, what you get is a, uh, a whole bunch of um, artifacts, documentation that you can trace all the way from um, high level requirement to the test results. You know, this is a requirement for um, commercial airplane builders, avionic systems that fly over commercial popul uh, population. So we're really excited to bring in the safety aspect uh, to WolfCrypt so that in addition to bringing privacy and security, we can bring safety uh, to the uh, to the field. Uh, so, I mean, you know, you uh, once you get the certification data package, you can pretty much trace everything, including the source code, including low low. So, for example, low level requirement. You know, you uh, you've got the your input, your output the review, uh, who did the review, how it passed. Um, and uh, for D178 is heavy in documentation and process. So we've got, we actually partner with another company called Verisol. Uh, Verisol are a uh, great company. They are not the biggest company, but they've got the best reputa rep reputation. Uh, they've been around for quite a while and uh, um, so, so it's an interesting and exciting project and uh, we hope to do more of this and get TLS 1.3 in 20, I mean next year as well. Um, I, mean, I don't want to bore you with the searching here, but let me, let me go to uh, Wolf SSL website. Oh, by the way, if you don't want to um, download 
an archive uh, you can go download from GitHub, uh, WolfSSL, you can download, evaluate, and test. The code is here. Uh, and for WolfBoot, um, I thought I had it. Yeah, for WolfBoot, yeah, it's got pretty, pretty good documentations if you go on a GitHub as well. Um, you know, the, you could, you can start here, you can build it, you know, run it on your system. Um, so now recover the CDP, recover WolfBoot. Um, let me go back to my slides. Okay, let me recap. So, uh, I mean, Wolf SSL brings TLS security to the IoT and avionics. So, um, you know, if there's any takeaway, important takeaway here is secure updates are very, very important to fix defects on the field, but also critical for vulnerability management. And, uh, and if you use Wolfboot, you know, you save yourself time and effort. You don't have to create a homegrown solution for different interfaces because um, you know, uh, it really implements a secure firmware authentication and a reliable update mechanism. Um, and we've got a dedicated full-time uh, uh, expert on WolfBoot. Uh, in addition, uh, you know, when you download the source code from our website or from GitHub, I mean, we help you. Uh, we've got best support, best tested crypto. So we help you come up. Uh, if you've got any question, you can send uh, your question to support at wolfssl.com and we'll help you uh, come up to speed and set it up. Um, you know, if you want to do custom or optimization, then, uh, then we'll, we'll talk about support or commercial license. But until that point, uh, you know, you, I really hope everyone utilizes uh, the uh, Superior Wolf SSL support because we uh, offer great customization, performance optimization, and fine tuning in your environment. I think that's the last slide. Uh, okay. And yeah. back to you, Joe. We have a couple of questions here. The first one is if the firmware image is securely signed and verified by Wolf Boot, why do we need to transfer the image securely? The secure boot feature should ensure that only an unmodified image is installed. So a secure transfer me method should not be necessary. Um, let's see, what if, what if uh, the person um, who is doing the update um, is signing an image and uh, trying to update, update that image uh, with another key? Um, I think that there's a reason why you need uh, secure transport uh, because you do not want anyone modifying um, the, the, the code. In addition, you do not want, you want the right private key that's on the server signing the image. I, I hope that answers your, your question. Um, uh, another question is, is the DO178C source code available online as well? For example, if we want to test against your libraries before moving to a system certi certification phase, where, we, where do we need to purchase your evidence? Oh, I see. So, you know, DO178C is, uh, is different. I mean, we do have PIPS 140-2 uh, ready solution if you want to evaluate and test it. For DO178C, the source code is a subset of what is available 
under our commercial license, as well as GPL V2 on Wolf SSL. So I can tell you that if you can uh, build and run with our regular Wolf SSL to make the switch to Wolf boot, I mean, to make the switch to the DO170AC would be a matter of customization. So uh, that source code is not available, uh, but um, you know, for 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 va validation. I mean, for evaluation. At least now, as I understand it. Um, how does Wolf Boot manage lost public-private key pair for signing um, FW updates? Uh, remember, once you create the private and public key, um, the private key never leaves the server. Um, if you lose it, then you can never do an update. Uh, similar to everything else, right? Like you lose your private key, um, you can't really do an update. In addition, um, you know, when you burn that wolf boot using JTAG on your target and the JTAG is away now. Um, it's got your public key there. Um, and uh, you cannot change that public key unless uh, you get a hold of the target and you use JTAG and then generate a private and public key pair and then update the uh, your system there. So you don't, you don't, you're not, we don't, we're not managing private and public keys. You just don't want to lose your private, your private key once you, uh, you deploy your system. Um, as we are talking about avions, what about conformance to the avionics security standard DO 326 or, or DO uh, 356A? Um, okay, can you repeat that question one more time? Oh, uh, they want to know what about conformance to the avionic security standard DO 326 uh, or DO 356A? Okay. Um, I think those are the aviation cybersecurity. Uh, we currently what we have is a DO one seven A C and the related, I think it's DO two fifty six. Uh, the number skips me, but the supporting document uh, that helps to clarify the DO one seven A C objectives. So um, I and, you know, it's not in our roadmap now, but it doesn't mean we cannot add it later. Okay. Um, who or what do you feel like are the biggest threats driving requirement for security? I mean, you know, security is such a hot topic now uh, that, you know, in this connected world where IoT devices are exploding and uh, our lives are very <laughs> dependent on being connected and connected securely. securely. Um, the main drivers are just a marketplace. I mean, I wouldn't want to fly on a commercial airplane where the security is compromised and, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, something bad could happen and I wouldn't want oh, I wouldn't want someone you know intercepting my personal information uh, or eavesdropping communication between myself and my kids over video or conference or something like that with the family so I think the driving factor is just it's just the day and age that we're in. You just need to security. So, um, uh, I mean, I, I think this this is like a broad and secure. I mean, broad area where security is is 
very, very much needed nowadays. Okay. Um, and are companies required to work with Verocell to certify their software for DO-178 applications? Not necessarily. Um, the reason why we selected, I mean, we evaluated a few certification houses and we selected to work with uh, Verocell. Uh, but, you know, you gotta, you gotta keep in mind that I mean, you want to work with the ones that have the best reputation and they've done great work for uh, VxWorks RTOS, DO-178 for uh, Integrity, uh, DO-178. So they've got pretty good reputation and they've been around for a while, really knowledgeable when it comes to certification, but you don't necessarily need to work with them. Uh, that's what we chose and we're pretty happy so far and by the way, I mean, um, the work that we've done, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's used by, uh, you know, an airplane engine. I mean, it's likely that you're flying on uh, an airplane that uses wolf clip. Right? So I hope that that answers your question next. Yeah, uh, that was the last of the questions. I was just would like to thank everyone for joining our webinar today. If you have any more questions, you can contact us at facts at wolfssl.com. Um, and I would also like to remind everyone we are on social media. So if you could please follow us on Twitter at wolfssl. Um, and it's also at Wolf SSL on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Um, and th this is a reminder for everyone that we will also send out a YouTube link of the webinar after uh, today. And so thank you everyone for joining and thank you Tesfa for, for being a wonderful, for a wonderful presentation. Oh, thank you. It was fun. Uh, thanks everyone.